Um, do you have a day job or are you 100% all in on this, um, I guess, pa- personal passion? One month ago, I made the jump, so I'm all in. Wow. That's, that's okay, Roger. Um, I think you're going to like this. I quit my job about three weeks ago. Um, Perfect. All, to, Perfect. To be all in, but, but uh, I, I don't know. My, my plans have sort of changed already, but I, I started a new job at the beginning of the year. Such a big move. Everything made sense. And then um, a few weeks ago, two months ago or something, the, the, the Grimes drop happened on Nifty Gateway. I'm mm-hmm. sure you, yeah. remember, you remember you were there for the action. And uh, I, I just had a one day, one full night binger of uh, kind of getting up to speed with NFTs. Uh, completely uh, skis over my head. Skis over my head? No, it's just, I'm blending phrases. But I completely like overcommitted on that one. And, uh, and, and I became a top customer of yours, which we'll tell the audience later. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it was an amazing day anyway. You know, I was in the Discord in Clubhouse. Um, and, then, and the next Monday came and I just couldn't go to work the same person. And, and that's how it basically made me lose my job. That's how bad NFTs are for you kids. Do not do, not do this. Maybe, right? Depends. Depends. <laughs> Depends on the situation. But I agree. I mean, ever, since I found them and really started deep diving, I remember, you know, some of the first impactful drops. I've been doing research for a bit before this, but I recall, you know, the first Velocious drop on Nifty. I recall going after that. And that was, I, I call that the first time my heart was broken, where, you know, I, that was back in the days when you maybe could fast click into ownership of an NFT. Those days have long since passed. But, uh, you know, I remember, I remember that distinctly, but those first drops, every spare moment that I had in my entire life outside of uh, my profession was spent doing more research, learning more, you know, being involved in the landscape, eventually getting involved in Twitter and starting to actually speak about what I was learning. Yeah, yeah. I think um, lots of people who come into this definitely share uh, kind of two facets of the background. You kind of have to love two things both the financial and investing aspect as well as the aesthetic aspect to really love this and and devote yourself to it um do, how what was your financial background how like wh- how did you get what, what was your experience there yeah global market making firm um so basically a private hedge fund i um, see tr- uh, and, and trader so trader uh, mo- mo- most of my work on the fixed income side and and then a little bit on stock options I see. Interesting. Um, and, you know, you, when you, you're also interested, like, of course, you develop an, an aesthetic side. Do you just do, focus on NFTs as art or do you all do you do like the baseball cards and and music and, and all the other kind of medium? Yeah, it's a good question. I poked around a bit at Metaverse land, um, started to learn there. Can't say can't say I got fully up to speed, but enough to own a parcel and, and, and explore some things. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the card side, are you, are you talking NFT NFT expressions? Yes, of, that's of right. Baseball card? Like yeah. like the uh, top shots. Top shot a, a little bit. Dabbled. I've dabbled. I've I've opened packs. I've sold some. Um, but I would not call myself a you know a super top shot user. I see. What do you think is um I don't know. How do you how do you think about the the, the other formats and and just kind of the art? Where I think we've spent a good amount of time on Nifty and, and other platforms. Like, do you find that you know, given that in investing, it's kind of good to have um, you know, some people are great generalists. You know, they can trade anything from oil to tech to to, to futures. Um, and some people are just specialists. They they only do TMT or something like that. Like, do you find yourself leaning one way or the other, and for any reason? I'm specializing in the art side right now. That's for sure. Um, it's where I've, you know, it's it's where I put down roots. It's where I've made my deepest connections, and, and again, just some straight up good friendships and, and good people. Um, alongside that investment side, you know, I, I, I do have a collection. There's there's a piece of my collection that I'll never sell, you know, mm-hmm. and then there's another piece of my collection that is is more of, a, of, of an investment that I, I do look for opportunities around. Um, I would call myself a specialist right now, uh, with the corner of my eye out on you know, tangential spaces. I see. And I guess um, for the art scene, what's, I guess for your, you started around 2000. Do you remember the piece that maybe got you into this? The one that kind of sent you down tumbling the rabbit hole for NFT art? Well, okay. So I guess the, the first NFT that I ever owned was Slam Sunday's Last Stand of the Nation State. 
Mm. And uh, I think it's a classic. A lot of people got involved in that job. That was hilariously, when we speak about it today and we look back, that was not that long ago. And that was a $40 artwork. Yeah. $40. That's, that's today, by, by today's terminology, that's insanity. Um, but, it, but that was my first owned NFT. I had been deep diving the space for a couple months prior to that. Um, what tumbled me down the rabbit hole? Okay, so I traded the, f- not the first, a drop right around that Slime Sunday drop. It was a twisted vacancy drop, and I traded that drop. I didn't know much about it, and then again, at the time, I was looking at NFTs solely through the investment lens. And I remember I showed up, I think it was a second um, tarot card deck, and it had this mechanic in there that if you collected a certain number of the tarot cards, then you would, if you collected a certain number of the tarot cards and you were one of the first three people to submit that you had collected that many, you received a, a one of three limited edition. And I remember just the entire night, you know, four hours, just, just buying, trading, everything. I came out of that changed. <laughs> altered it definitely woke up the next morning like you said a, a different human being right you just couldn't you couldn't do the, the the regular job anymore exactly yeah um do you find was there anything in your trading background working in traditional finance that like prepared you or gave you a real kind of advantage you think in um trading nfts um i'm a little less subject subject to the fomo Mm. Uh, I think things are moving so insanely fast and, and the landscape truly is changing daily. Um, I, I actually legitimately think it is. However, some things that seem like they're changing are not. So I think it's just balance. It's being able to step back from the absolute madness that we are all living right now and un- trying to understand. Don't always get it perfect. Sometimes I make moves, of course, that I would take back. But yep. On the whole, I think I'm a, a little, because of that experience, a little better suited to understand what is and what isn't so. And, and what and what I don't know equally is important. What do you think, are, um, if you can maybe give us a blow by blow, either by month or quarter, like in your mind, what are the major kind of shifts in the market and its attitudes? Um, when did you start, sorry, in, in 2020? First, per- first purchase was in early November 2020, and then I would say probably for two months prior, I was deep diving NFTs. Gotcha. So from November to today and kind of late March, what would you say are the major, um, I don't know, give us a lay of the land. What happened in this couple of, last couple of months? Yeah, interesting. So, I mean, you know, the parabolic explosion was Jan to Feb, you know, um, hints of it, so, some of it started in December, but really like Jan. Jan and Feb were everything changed. And now, okay, let me, let me, speaking strictly from the investment side, okay? Sure. If you started back back when I made my first purchase, November, December, you could print money in NFTs. (laughs) And and it really does seem like five years ago. Yeah. But November, December, everything was nascent. But if you did your deep dive and you had a head on your shoulders and you knew a, a bit of the lay of the land, you could print money, right? If that was your focus. Again, my focus changed a bit as as I was progressing through the industry. Now we get to Jan Feb. You get you have your parabolic rise. Everything money's growing on trees still, but the long term hold opportunities are starting to dwindle. Mm-hmm. So because it's you know it's on its parabolic surge, eventually we hit what in certain cases has been market top, right? Now, recently, I thought that the last golden opportunity in NFTs, there still are some of these opportunities, but I thought the last golden opportunity in NFTs from the investment side strictly was to go into secondary platforms. And by secondary platforms, I used to phrase this as everything not named Nifty Gateway, right? Yeah. I thought you could go into the cabinets of those platforms, of the makers' places, of the known origins, and and try to raid the cupboard, right? And try to... There are a lot of older collectors and some are disinterested in in their NFT holdings. Some may not care anymore. Some are less passionate and some are looking to get out. And and for a newer collector who's interested in building a collection, Mm -hmm. being able to to do that and and look at, you know, develop a thesis, develop a thesis on a number of artists that you care about, that you believe in, that you believe have futures in this and, and go after it. Right. 
Now that opportunity recently, I think has borderline gone away on Maker's Place because mm-hmm. people came. And with people, I started to see a lot of people go after that strategy, right? A lot of people were putting bids in on, you know, several top artists, several OG artists. And yeah, the, that's drying up. I think Known Origin probably still has a bit of that opportunity. Super Rare is also drying up. I've seen a lot of people go back on these artists that are are, are clearly making themselves known. And yeah, you're just, you're just seeing these old pieces go one by one by one. When you say um, develop a thesis for mm-hmm. um, for one of these artists, I know what an investment thesis for a company looks like. What is what does it look like? And what does it mean? And maybe what's your process for uh, building a thesis for for an NFT drop or an NFT artist? Yeah, it's, a, it's tough because it's a, it's a bit more nebulous, right? Mm-hmm. I believe in people first. That's just how I operate, um, and that's where the lines are blurred for me, right? I always go. I go back to this point. It's really important to me to make that I came in investment only, and I've now shifted percent percent, right? And so. You know, some of these people I care about so much, I will never sell their artwork, right? Mm. And, and, all right, so how do I develop a a thesis? Pulling back from that, right? I just always want to make clear where I'm at, um, mind and, I call it like uh, mind and heart wise. Um, All right, people. Who are they, right? Are they here to stay? Well, start with their social, right? I think that's the easiest way to get to know someone nowadays. So start with their social. Um, are they here to say what kinds of things are they saying I, I, I'm going to try not to drop any names unless it's in a positive light but there have been artists that seem disenchanted and, and I get it hey listen I've been there before in different industries right yeah. it's it's difficult at times but when I feel that vibe it, con- it concerns me a little bit It's I don't know where someone's head's at and, and in terms of having hundreds and thousands of artists that you can look out and no, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's fantastic art everywhere but there's a lot of really good art in, in digital art right now mm-hmm. and so when you're looking to decipher and, and like you said go back to the word thesis when you're looking to develop the thesis a lot of times it does come down to how are they feeling right now you know how, do, do I feel as though they're fired up to be here inspired to be here how are they conveying those thoughts how are they telling their story how are they providing context to the art so these things are all, all important to me and how, do you consume their social media feeds? Do you read their interviews? What, what kind of stuff do you do? Yeah, the, what I really love to do is, is connect with people, right? I, I like to actually talk to people um, and let them know I'm a real person too, huh. right? I think that, that piece is important to me. That's, um, very, that's very much like traditional equity research. You go visit management. I, I, I value those connect. Like I said, I have straight up friendship, lifelong friendships in this space. And I know it seems insane to say that with such a short period of time. Wow. I've spent more time with certain artists than I have with my best friends in real life. And what? they're becoming my like like I have <laughs> best friends in art that are that are my very, very real friends. And how so I would not I would not trade that. How is that possible? You started in, in like December. You've spent enough how did you spend so much time with them versus friends you've spent presumably years um whom you've known for more than years. Well, Think of it like compounding time, right? Let's say you talk to someone every single day. I mean, who do you talk to every single day? I mean, I talk to my friends, like day, second day basis. That's that's some solid friend. I guess when I'm my best friends in life, I'm talking to probably one to two times a week. Okay. But fast friendships right yeah. sometimes in the space especially with social especially yeah. with time spent on on twitter on discord yeah. on clubhouse now right sometimes it's daily and yeah i mean i've just really grown to value some of these individuals that's incredible i mean but with my friends with like as our non-nft artist friends we have a you know a common background from maybe school maybe work maybe i don't know technology interests um, what what do you talk about with um, given that you're kind of a patron of their art? Like, what do you? How do you interact? What is your common thing that you 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 do? Well, I mean, uh, it's extended personally, which is really nice in, in some of these cases. Mm. But we're learning together. You know, I have friends. I have friends in art now that we're learning together. They're learning the landscape too, and you know, maybe they're doing it from the artistic perspective, and I'm doing it from the collection perspective. But we're we're casting our eyes out there and, and 
breaking down platforms and trying to understand what's going on and, and market perception and everything. And, uh, and yeah, so, so I've developed that inner circle of people that as things happen, we're, we're talking about those things. Wow. That is amazing. And I feel, I, I feel a little, <laughs> no, I don't feel so good because I, I, I've been, um, mostly coming in from a, like initially it came from an artistic, uh, interest, uh, and then it became an investing thing. It's in, inevitable. Um, but like, I think that's great that you're building actually relationships on that level with these artists. I mean, arguably the classic art collectors back in the day. I mean, I guess the best of them did, but but often, uh, you know, even even that uh, was was rather like not not very personal and, and kind of anonymous. So that's great to hear. And and but I also, you know, I, w- I would say sorry to interrupt you, James, but I would I, I owe a lot to these artists and friends, like I. You know, it's like it goes beyond, right? It's I owe a lot to them because my inner my inner circle of friends in NFTs. It's that's why I made the jump. You know, that's why I came over is yeah. because there's there's a significant measure of belief that I have in the NFT space, and like we talked about before, it's right now that's being a specialist in digital art, and I made that jump because of the belief, the you know, and I'm, I'm hey I. This is a crusade, right? Uh, I am on a bit of a personal mission here to put some respect on digital art. Now, listen, it's already happening, and I love it. I love it. I mean, Be- Beeple is a trailblazer, right? <laughs> he he's extending out Pack is a trailblazer, right? And there's plenty of more trailblazers that are going to come as well. And I I fashion myself one of them. I, I want respect on digital art, and I want respect to my friends. Like that's it. Period. End of story. You mentioned respect a lot, um, and it's almost like there is a lot, I guess, implicit in what you're saying is there's a lack of total respect for digital art. Could you yes. set up the problem for us? What do you think is the the consensus view, and what do you think should be the correct view? Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's can I hold it in my hands, right? That seems to be the big gap in understanding. I think when you're in, when you're in cryptocurrency, we have respect for cryptocurrency. Sometimes it can seem like that's the whole world and it's far from it. I think a lot of people are still adopting it. A lot of people are still understanding it. Even those who have adopted cryptocurrency, many of them still have no no concept of having a wallet. What does a wallet mean? What does a wallet allow for? Have they used MetaMask before? Things like this, right? Yep. These are all things I had to learn. Now listen, I was a cryptocurrency adopter. I owned cryptocurrency. And I still had a learning curve when it came to MetaMask and linking that to Super Rare to buy the shout out to Victor Mascara to bid, to bid on one of his artworks back in the day that I fell in love with. Um, I, I learned all these things, right? And I have respect for those who are pre that learning curve. And so I think that's an obstacle. That's a barrier. Um, anyway, sorry, I, I actually went on a tangent there. That's, that's the technical barrier. But now let's go back to a major problem. And that is the, you know, the physical versus digital. The, if I can't hold it in my hands, then what good is it? The, the right click save as, right? That, that cliche, sure. right? That seems silly in industry, but out of industry, actually some people really believe that. Um, and then we, but then we get into, it's just education. It's just education. It's the physical trading card that you hold in your hand, the, the, the top, I use the, like the, the tops, 1987 Barry Bonds rookie card, right? You hold that in your hand and you don't own a copyright. You can't mass distribute that card, right? You're holding a piece of cardboard and you have rights to sell that piece of cardboard. And you're probably buying that piece of cardboard because you either believe in tops or you believe in Barry Bonds or you love baseball or some combination of the three, right? It's the same thing with an NFT. Why are you buying an NFT? What good is that cardboard, right? As framing like literal digital frames on your wall, you know, you, the metaverses improve. As these things improve, that barrier is gonna be gone. It won't matter if you can hold the cardboard in your hand. You're buying that NFT, It'll go back to the Victor Mascara, right? Love you, Victor. Um, patterns unfolding. Why did I want patterns unfolding? I thought it was a hell of an artwork. My favorite artwork I've ever seen. And belief in Victor, and belief to an extent in Super Rare. You have to believe in the platform behind it too, a little bit at least. Yep. And so there you go. You have the same thing. Tops, Barry Bonds, baseball. Art, Victor, Super Rare. 
when you say you have to believe in SuperRare, the platform a bit, are you referring to the fact that they're you're relying on them to to an extent for curating credible artists? Um, and also platform integrity to an extent. Mm-hmm. You know, technical. I do think I'm, I mean platforms are coming that will will, will m- maybe do away with this at some point, but for the time being, your art lives on SuperRare. You know. Um, no, you can transfer your, your artwork off to your own wallet and, and take it off of a platform. But again, that gets into the technical weeds. Not everyone's comfortable doing that. Yep. So if you purchase an artwork, you have to make an assumption it's going to live on that platform for a while. And so, you know, you have to have a, a, a bit of belief. People in crypto are extremely big on self-custody. And I've, uh, uh, you know, not your not your key, not your, not your coin. Uh, I've, I've moved some of my um, pieces to my MetaMask wallet, but it is definitely a daunting process. You feel, like, you feel like you're about to send an email with an attachment, and if it doesn't go right, the attachment disappears, and you can't get it back, and you've paid a, couple, a handsome amount of coin for that attachment. What do you think of self-custody? Like, I notice you have a lot on Nifty Gateway. Um, I have a lot on Nifty Gateway. It's, uh, it's obviously a security risk. H- how did you think through that problem? Ooh, I'm still thinking through that problem. And I do think it's a consideration. I do. Um, I think security risks are real. And it, this is something I'm, it, this is right now, you know, this is, this is a very current thing. I think it's worth thinking about. I think it's worth potentially, um, you know, <laughs> diversifying your risk. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it, yeah, it's top of mind right now. So it's still an open, open kind of a problem for that even you're working through. That's right. Yep. Yeah, that's great. I prefer the I definitely appreciate the candor. Um, wow, this is good. This is um, this is great to get your perspective because often I think buyers and uh, are are sort of working in a vacuum and and uh, hearing a different perspective is, is definitely helpful. Um, let's see. We talked about your process. We talked about your story. Um, and, and it's a great overview of kind of how the few, few last couple of months have evolved in the market. Well, given kind of your summary of, of your view of how the market is right now, which is kind of far more mature in a, in a, in a my sense, it's in a, in a um, state of consolidation because we have a lot of supply coming online by the day on Nifty and other platforms. Um, but also, obviously, just with press and everything, we're drawing a lot of buyers into the, into the ecosystem. And prices seem to have reached a equilibrium um, it seems um, and it's not clear the easy money quote unquote seems to be made it is not clear how quite to maybe orientate one strategy um, going forward mm-hmm. next you know six months or so would, would you agree with that and how do you think through this problem yeah thesis right goes back to that thesis yeah i really think anyone who's considering nfts from an investment perspective you know you could buy art because you like it right i think if you can do that you you'll you won't be upset okay so let me get that out of the way right that's that's an easy way to be happy (laughs) but if you but if you are coming into this from an investment perspective you have to have a belief system and your belief system might be wrong but i think it's at least worth formulating one and so, you know, how I see this thing going is a lot of supplies coming into the space. And that's indisputable. Everyone's going to want to be in NFTs. Everyone already, I mean, it already does seem like everyone wants to be in NFTs. So, okay, when the supply side gets flooded, what happens? You know, things get drowned out, unfortunately. And I've been beating this drum. I think there are two groups of artists that win. And the first group is a little less under your control. And I guess now I'm almost shifting the dialogue to speak to artists as well, but I think anyone can get value out of this. Mm -hmm. One is out of your control, and that is being deemed a blue chip, okay? Now, some people will be deemed blue chip that we'd all agree deserve it. Others, by forces that be, there's going to be a group, whether you believe they should or shouldn't be there, or maybe, or whatever, there's going to be blue chip artists, quote unquote. The group that's under your control that you can be is the other type of artist that I believe succeeds. And that's the artist that cultivates community. And, you know, I think if, if there's great artwork, I think it's equally as important because of the supply side. I'd love to be a purist and say the art wins on its own. And in some cases it may, but when the supply side gets flooded, there's some damn good art that's going to get buried. It's just a fact. 
It's yeah. just a fact. And so the community builders, I believe, make it through and shine. Uh, so again, blue chips and community builders. Who are those people? If you can find, if you can develop a thesis around people you feel may combine the two, that's, that's incredible. I, I think that's a home run. Maybe one person who kind of exemplifies that would be Mad Dog Jones, um, someone who had a great reputation ahead of time. I found him before NFTs happened, and I always wanted to his work. And this is part of the appeal of NFTs. Like I was trying to, I was building on a, I don't know, a cyberpunk art appreciation phase uh, two years ago, and I looked through all the Instagram accounts, and and cl the clear standout. Many people were working on it, but the clear standout was Mad Dog Jones. Um, and I followed him, and I'm like, okay, where can I buy some? If not originals, then some merch. Give me an Akira T-shirt or something, right? And there's just no such thing. He he just you know he did commission work, and he had one show, a uh, physical like um, art exhibit, but there was nothing I could actually pay him even as a token of appreciation or fandom, mm -hmm. which was very frustrating. And of course, like November comes around and he starts, you know, dropping stuff. God, I was so frustrated. I didn't get in the first one. I literally was ready, but I, w I wasn't sure if Nifty Gateway was a scam, so I didn't buy the first one of one. Fair, fair. Oh God, I, I of all the regrets. I, I finished second to both, both Mad Dog one of ones. Part of his first drop, I oh. finished runner up to both one of ones. Goodness Lord! Oh God! Okay, we we have some similar frustrations. Yeah. Oh God! So yeah, um, so so yeah. I mean, I was trying to literally, I was trying to throw money at Mad Dog, but there was no there was no slot in the in the vending machine. Um, and NF NFTs, you know, to use kind of that um, Nick Zabos um, kind of analogy of smart contracts being a vending machine. It's like a vending machine with a menu that ranges from a dollar to a million dollars. And it's like, pick your item. And, and it's, it's just great. So, uh, but back to what we're f talking about. Yeah, like Mad Dog clearly has an amazing kind of community building ethic. Um, he's always in the Discord chatting people up. And now he's regarded as a blue chip, right? He's a top five grossing NFT artist. So uh, for me, that's, like, that's probably the best example of, um, of someone who kind of crosses both. I'm a huge fan of Dog Jones fan. Can I tell you a story? Totally. This is this is my greatest failure. <laughs> Full stop. My greatest failure as an NFT, uh, and, and this is really where the line blurs between investor and collector, because Mad Dog, um, you you asked me for formative moments, right? And I told you coming in and investing, my first purchase, trading a drop, like you know, with that solely investment hat, and then how it started to shift to collecting. Mad Dog was probably. <clears throat> what shifted me most earliest into that. I loved Mad Dog Jones. I do, love, to this day, yeah. I love Mad Dog Jones. That that drop with his, his phone booth, ideas of, ideas of the currency, thought as a system. Yeah. I sat there that night, and I mentioned I finished runner-up to both one of ones. Unfortunately, I didn't have a ton of capital at the time. Um, there was a moment I thought I had both of them, and that was <laughs> it was a shame how that worked out. Uh -huh. But drop night. I bought eight phone booths, eight phone booths. Wow. Okay. And just sat there and just mashed. I'm like, I, I just, I see this so clearly, James, see it so clearly that Mad Dog is a rock star yep. and I have to have as many phone booths as I can, I can get my hands on. Yeah. So, okay. I buy, I buy eight phone booths that night. My greatest failure in NFTs, period, end of story, was I made some poor decisions thereafter. And I had always had in the back of my mind that I was gonna keep the set of Mad Dog's phone booths, okay? Boom, boom, boom. I had all three. There was, so there was a one of 50, a one of 50, and then there was that mechanic that you could get a one of five if you paired the two, And right? the phone booths were a buck each at the time, right? They were a buck each, and then they, they started trading it the, the two to $300 range uh, uh -huh. immediately, and, and evolved from there. Did, did, did you get all eight? Prime like as a primary sale, or you bought seven as secondaries. Zero primary, zero primary. Oh, okay, okay. So you so went in all, all secondary market. I see, I see. For a couple of hundred so, bucks each. Yeah, so between two and three hundred for seven of the eight, and fifteen hundred because I bought one of the five. I see, I see. Oh okay. God. Yeah. So here's the, here's the 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 greatest failure. Okay. The the days are passing, the weeks are passing, and initially the market dipped. And okay, no problem. And, and like I told you, one of my strong suits is, is keeping a level head. 
Well, somewhere along the way, and I don't know why, I, I, I don't even know if I could explain this. Who knows? Maybe I got FOMO elsewhere. Maybe I didn't like, I don't know. Maybe I wanted to reallocate capital. I, I really can't tell you. I remember the thought dawning on me. You know what? Let me, let me aid, let me walk the market back up instead of waiting for it to correct. And again, I viewed it as a correction. Again, mm-hmm. belief 100% Mad Dog Jones. So I started to walk it back up, sell a phone booth. And one of the things that happened was I had this bad habit then of every nifty I owned, almost every nifty I owned, I had this bad habit of always feeling like I had to price it, right? <laughs> Even if I didn't want to sell it. And I would price it three, four, five X above what I perceived the market as. This is an old habit. This has been correct. By since. pricing, you mean listing it at that price? That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. So list, so listing it at that price. So I recall at the time, I actually was considering, even while I was like walking the market back up and parting with a few phone booths, the, the one of five edition, I remember almost buying a second one. <laughs> And, and someone had sold one for six, I think it was like $666 or something like this, okay? And I thought it was preposterously cheap. And I remember hovering over the buy button and actually having someone buy it, okay? So I missed that on that one, but just to give you an idea where the market was, I had mine priced at $2,500. Overnight, shortly thereafter, someone snatched it. And I remember waking up in the morning, seeing that someone had bought it at 4X where the market was, and thinking to myself, I made a mistake. <laughs> it just, just, I made a mistake. And, and that was the emotion that washed over me. And the story is not done. I, I have one more piece to it. I just rage sold my other phone booths. Like, worst decision ever. All of them? <laughs> no more phone booths. All eight, seven, eight were all sold. So at, that, so at, the, at the point the, the of five was, 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 I call it taken from me, James. It's visceral. <laughs> this, this cuts me deep. Taken by you listing. Okay. To, no, no. no I, you, you get me. I, yeah. I understand. I yeah. did it. It's my fault. It's always on my shoulders. But it's, it's just, uh, it, it's more of a joke than anything at yeah. this point. Um, yeah. I don't even know where I was going. Now, now I'm all distracted. No, no. But why did you rate? What was the, why did Look, you listed a thing at a high price, and and you and someone bought it from you. Any quote unquote normal reaction is cool, um, but you felt bad. And why did you sell the rest, though? Emotion, and I, I think this speaks to something. Okay, number one, I have I have a very high belief and, and conviction in myself, right? <laughs> but I'm not infallible. And, and I try to be as humble as possible about that, right? Even when I'm, even when I'm trying to describe something that I feel is true, or, you know, that I have a high conviction in, not perfect, right? I have to always leave that door cracked that I could be wrong about something. Yeah. I'm not infallible, man. I made a mistake. And, and that show, I think that shows you, <laughs> shows you how much I fell in love with his art. But you know? I still don't quite understand. Like when you say you made a mistake selling, but what, what, was the, what was the emotion that led you to sell the rest of the seven? That I didn't have the I didn't have the set anymore. Oh, that was why. I see. Because I had because and I was pissed. I was I was mad at myself. Right. I had said to myself that this is so again. These are the first artworks that I said to myself. I'm never selling these. I see. Right. I see. Other than other than Slime Sundays, or like I'm never going to sell that NFT. It's my first ever NFT. Just sorry, like I can't. I just can't part with it ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, plus, I have a high level of respect for Slime too. Yeah. Um, but this was the, the first NFTs that I had earmarked in my mind as <laughs> I'm always going to keep this set. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I had that bad habit, right? And I don't, oh. it seems silly. It seems stupid, right? I had that bad habit of, well, of course I have to list the NFT, right? <laughs> Even 4X, 5X above, I'm no intention of selling it. It just sits out there in the stratosphere. And in this case, it bit me. And I realized it was a horrible habit to have. And it cost me my Mad Dog Jones set. And then wow. in, a, in a fit of emotion, it cost me all of my Mad Dog Jones. Oh, wow. That's uh, that, you know, people say investing is, you know, all about it. Like half the game is emotions. And, and the most the, you're playing not against just the market, but you're playing against yourself. That's yes. probably as illustrative of a story for that as possible. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be the cautionary tale for someone else to not make the same mistake. 
Wow. And just for context, you know, you know, we all talk about these names as if the whole uh, audience knows the, uh, the, the, the kind of price of these artworks. Um, the phone booths were the first release from, from the artist Mad Dog Jones. Uh, check out Mad Dog Jones on Twitter or Instagram. Amazing stuff. Uh, and uh, they were released for a dollar each pretty much as an experiment. Sold the next day, next couple of weeks for $200, $300. And today trades at over 100 k um, I think the highest bid I put in for a phone booth. One day, like a couple of weeks ago, I got FOMO on phone booth. And and I put in, I think, an order for like 80 k It never filled. So so uh, th- it's, uh, this is one of those money printing <laughs> artworks that happened in the last couple of months. Well, you shared a great story, Roger. Um, do you mind if I share one? Yeah, please. Yeah. So I... My day, of course, of, of utter addiction was was the Grimes drop a couple of weeks ago. And um, I was convinced that Grimes was going to be the next ultimate blue chip. Um, I had tasted Mad Dog Jones. I bought uh, one of the kind of like a few drops ago, Dead Ramen, um, which I absolutely loved that piece. I think every person who follows Mad Dog loves that piece. Uh, and I saw how that appreciated t- r- roughly 10, 20 X. And I was convinced Grimes was going to set that up. Um, like for her, for the genre that's like NFT art, which is very much kind of almost a commentary on the future and using technology that's borderline or basically kind of very futuristic and, and both cyber and cypherpunk. Um, I thought Grimes basically had the perfect aesthetic for this form. And and of course, she's the mother of the heir apparent of, of human civilization. So, like everything in my mind, set her up to be the goddess of NFTs. And I just said, mm-hmm. I have to be ready, and I have to go in hard. I can't just like, I didn't even know you could buy secondaries until that, that Sunday. Like, I didn't. It never even occurred to me to buy a second copy of Ramen or Phone Booth or anything because I didn't. It didn't even occur to me. I, I just. I always thought Nifty was this. Just wait for the seven o'clock bell and buy as fastly as you can. That's how, mm-hmm. that's how crudely I came into this. So I the night before I create five accounts. I'm like the only opportunity is in the primary markets, um, and I FOMO my way into Grimes. I buy Earth. I buy I buy Mars, and I put in a crazy. I, I she had three limited edition, one of tens, um, and uh, I, I thought there's no way I can compete against the first two because the first one is the one that gets all the bids basically every time there's a listing but whatever is the first one even if it's ugly people will bid for that one the most so I'm like I'll skip the first one out of game theory the second one I'll skip as well. I'll just go for the third one, which is called Rococo Monolith. And I put in an 80K bid for Rococo Monolith. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. Yeah, exactly. I was like, I don't know. Grimes is going to be so big. I probably can't even get this. It's probably going to be 120K and I'll be priced out. And I totally didn't understand the waterfall pricing of the top 10 where like the first person is super high. And then the next nine are like one tenth the price. Did not Did not understand that. Um, of course, Grimes drop happens, and uh, I win by first the, the the first you know high res gods and, and those those lists. And I'm instantly I, I I knew I overbid on on Brokoko Monolith, and of course I win the, the the top prize quote unquote, which is to say you know I bid way too high uh, for for 80k for Brokoko Monolith. Um, and Earth and Mars sold, you know. Uh, Grimes had sold those open editions at $10,000 a piece initial price, reduced them to $7,500. I'm not sure if that was the first time this happened, but like that's quite irregular, I would say. I mean, what's your experience, Roger? Sorry, irregular to have the price that high? Have the price be dropped like two days ahead of the, the event. Uh Price changes do happen pretty, pretty close to the event, mm-hmm. but the uniqueness for me of that was was just the height of those prices. Yeah, those are are some of the highest open edition open editions at the time. Since there have been a few um, that rival it, but I'm just trying to think if I can dial up one that was more before that. Right. So open editions for those um, in the audience are just uh, kind of kind of like unlimited prints for the window that the sale is happening so it could end up being a few hundred few thousand maybe um releases of that of that piece um and the limited editions are like 10 or 50 or, or something far more closed 
But um, yeah, anyway, that night I, I I way overspent because I got fever. I got a fever that night, and 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 then simultaneously the same day I realized there's this thing called secondaries, and that's when I started like, okay, I didn't get the other ten of tens. I overspent on that one for eighty. So these ones that are listing for forty is a bargain. That's how I rationalized it in my mind, uh, and of course I, I bought two of the the other tens at at forty k, and one of them I bought from you, Roger. High res was high res gods. It was no, no, it was um, Battle of the War Nips. Battle of the War Nips. That's right. That's the first one. Um, um, so that's how Roger and I, our paths actually crossed, uh, not knowingly at the time. Uh, he sold me a, a wonderful piece for forty k. Did, did I overpay Roger? What do you think? <laughs> this is interesting, right? Because the the prices of Grimes in general, especially the open editions, have you know some might look at it and say they've cratered, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just not. Conv- I think Grimes is an artist who has a chance to make it out of this and history to smile on her. I I, I think that is absolutely plausible. Um, as these prices go down, I, I don't think it's a bad buying opportunity. I do think it does come down to what her plans are. Yeah. Um, if she sticks around the NFT space, if she keeps evolving in the NFT space, I don't see why she wouldn't. Um, I ju- I don't think it's that bad of a bet in fact maybe some alpha i mean if you can get the right price on a grimes piece i don't think that's the worst purchase that's that's part of that echelon of artist because of how she's positioned who's in a certain inner circle depending upon her future plans that could be a blue chip artist absolutely i can see it i can see that that pathway very very clearly I, I do think it's contingent upon our future plans. Yep. So if, I don't know if anyone has any info on that. You know, maybe that strengthens or weakens your conviction depending upon which way you see that going. Absolutely think that could end up being a blue chipper. Absolutely think if you can get something low enough, I, I would nod and, and, and smile. And even for you, James, even for, you know, your number one on the monolith, even for the 40K of War Nips, I could see history smiling on that too. It might take some more time, but... I can see it. Yeah, I can see it too. Or otherwise, I would be genuinely depressed rather than just poking fun of myself. Um, I think that if I were to be critical, if I were to kind of give my postmortem on Grimes, it would be um, she clearly viewed for herself as hot shit, and she is hot shit. I love her music, and she's married to you know Elon, uh, not married, but you know partners with Elon. Um, and her art is completely unique, both music and, and visuals. Um, but she did price it at like that level. Like she basically priced it 10x. She she spacked her art <laughs> for the lack of a better right, term. Right, right. So it came in at high, and you know people bought at the open, and and now we have this kind of it's down 50 whatever percent, and and um, it's it's in this digestion phase, of course. But. Um, because of her success in other aspects of life, I'd say she doesn't have to be as scrappy um, and as, um, um, you know, just hustle as hard as the more grassroots artists that I think you like to support and that, that people love and, and you know, and like, like Mad Dog. She can, she has so many ways to, to be that, that, you know, she doesn't have to be really hustling and, and um, beating on her NFT drum. But if she continues down the track, she called it volume one as the release, right? So if she can actually build on this and releases volume two, she just signed a new record label, I think with Colum- Columbia. Um, uh, but if, you know, her creative avenues, like she, all her content has a, like a narrative through it. It's not like every art, every album is just this discreet like piece. Like there's a whole overarching story that she's trying to build. Um, and I think that fits really well with the NFT genre. Um, uh, so if she can build on that and we feel like volume t- volume two drops and has this kind of story arc with volume one and she has new music to go with it, I can absolutely see um, Smashing Success um, talking my book with Grimes. I, I agree. I agree. And I, I, I even think for someone of her stature, you know, you, we don't need the... It doesn't have to be as NFT social media evol- uh, in- involved or, or as focused on necessarily building her NFT specific social media community. Yeah. I think in her case, it's continue doing amazing things overall, just period, end of story in yeah. her creative pursuits. And then when it does come time to produce NFTs and to orchestrate a drop, to your point, have that story thread, put out quality art. Don't mail it in because we've seen recently 
not naming names. Yep. We've seen recently several instances of those with high profiles mailing in drops. And the art quality, it's a shrug. I'm not saying it's terrible. It's just okay. Yeah. It, it, and and that's and that may be fine for them. Maybe fine for what they have planned. But I'll tell you, it's it's those with stature who come into the space and you can tell they care and they put a lot into the artwork and the storytelling and the thread that ties the artworks together. They're huge, they're just going to be huge winners. Absolutely. Totally agreed. Uh, let's see. Cool. That's I think that covers. Let's bring some folks over um, for Q&A. Uh, I know some folks have had their hands up. Uh, let's see if, if you would like to ask Roger a question or just talk about any of the kind of topics we've discussed. Uh, please raise your hand and we'd love to take your questions. Okay, we have one from Joshua. Adding Joshua. Hey, thanks, guys. What do you think about the open editions from some of the top names? Um, obviously, it'd be hard to get some of the limited editions, but looking for something that's more in the maybe 10 to 20, 40K range. Joshua, any, anyone specific that you're focused on? Just give me a little bit more context to that question. Are you, are you, like, are you, are you saying uh, open editions that might be coming out? you know, this week in in present moment or some of the past open editions that you're looking at? Uh, Some of the upcoming ones. I mean, Bass Jackers. um, I know I forgot the weather one got delayed last year because the IP issue with DC Comics or whatever it was too. Uh, Boss Logic. So so some decent sized names. Yeah, I mean, okay. So there's a couple layers to this question. One one person you just mentioned, Boss Logic. I'm a massive, massive Boss Logic fan. Both of the, the, speaking of, you know, the person intersecting with the art. And I think that's a winner on both of those fronts. Now, in terms of open editions, it's a bit of a tricky space right now. And my own personal thesis on open editions is evolving by by the day, right? Um, Right now, on certain platforms, the pricing and the quantity, the intersection of pricing and quantity is, is just being pushed. I think maybe, maybe, if there are more and more and more collectors and investors that come into the space, maybe it's okay at some point in time. But I think it continues to be pushed in such a way that it can't persist forever. You know, These quantities that are being purchased in conjunction with some of the pricing choices that are being made, it worries me, it worries me. And so I'm a bit more reserved these days on open editions, unless I have a clear, yeah, a, unless I have a clear separate thesis that that makes me believe in that particular open edition for a different reason. I think some artists are beginning to use them creatively. There are beginning to be some creative mechanics baked in there. Some of the open editions are tying to other editions in some ways, shapes and forms, unlocking other possibilities, potentials, lotteries, etc. That's interesting, right? That, that's a whole different ballgame. Um, other artists have done, you know, if you own certain numbers of open editions that you then get a, an additional NFT. Again, all that aside, the, the pricing and quantities currently worry me and I can't tell you go gung-ho. I really believe in the investment opportunity, but for the art, sure. I mean, if, if there's some fabulous open editions from that perspective. God, and then are there any properties for, for NFT specifically outside of the digital art, or outside of the traditional art realm that maybe you should look out for? Either higher mintage, how much does it actually matter? I mean, future display properties. I mean, if you get a larger print, it may be easier to put on a wall or some other display that would be more, more palatable uh, given it's an NFT versus a traditional piece of art. Anything specific around NFTs just makes it different or more valuable or less valuable than traditional art. It's a good question. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. It's, you know, how do we see the, how do we see the NFT market playing out? I mean, obviously it's going to eat part of, you know, physical arts lunch, right? That's inevitable. Um, there's always going to be a place for physical art, but it's going to eat part of its lunch. So yeah, I mean, in this space, you know, are there unique qualities to NFT, to NFT art pieces that we see an ultimate market expansion overall? I don't know. I think the best we can do is use traditional art as proxies. Look at 
top artist prints quantities what those types of things go for you know try try to make some ties and do our best from there um but i, I can't say i have a, a great projection on what you're asking for awesome much appreciated thanks guys yeah thanks josh I mean, the way on that, just the, the overall macro thesis, I kind of like think of the way as, um, you know, some market dynamics are cannibalistic and some are additive. Uh, if you look at kind of, say, you know, very classic example, what happened to PCs versus smartphones? Um, yes, PC sales kind of plateaued, um, but it, 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 didn't, it didn't decline in a secular way. In the last two years, at least, due to COVID, PC sales are up a lot. Um, one of the healthiest two years in its kind of history. Um, but generally speaking, if you look, you visualize the graph, basically PCs grew during the 90s and 2000s and then plateaued out, went flat, and then smartphones just stacked on top as a new S-curve. Um, and you know, given that the traditional demo for physical art tend to be a different age and different, just a different generation. I think they'll continue. They'll probably, <laughs> they'll probably view NFTs as a fad or as a scam. That's the, they're certainly writing plenty of those stories. Um, whereas new buyers like us are basically adding to the overall market. If you want to count them as one monolithic market, so I I think of it as a stacking on top. Um, and the real question is, you know, is it is it larger? I think it's going to be larger. It's just, I mean, the liquidity will almost certainly guarantee it. Um, but for me, like the the, the personal experience of Anything where it makes it easy to buy just makes makes it larger. And NFTs are just addictively easy to buy. It makes you, it makes you fiscally irresponsible. I don't know anyone's gone broke buying Picassos, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. It, it really is interesting when looking at it through that light. I, I think you could be on to something there, and it just makes me think, and it makes me guess at you know what will what will those platforms be yeah. that are ultimately regarded as as the curated place to go right right now it's a bit of the wild wild west we have some market leaders i mean i've been beating the drum i think the largest platform of two years from now doesn't exist today yeah um you know we just did see that mark cuban led you know that that mark cuban group announcement of, of nifties not to be confused with nifty gateway uh coming coming to market with a, a massive undertaking of like the intersection of social and creation and purchasing so I'm, I'm very curious to see what they do but i do think the door is open right now totally um we'll take more questions if anyone wants to come up state uh come up on stage um but roger while we're waiting on that one question for you are you enjoying your, your nft art as in are you are you displaying them? Are you printing them? Are you putting on them on dis- um, digital displays? Uh, are you doing anything with them? I, I'm waiting. I am waiting for the right digital display. Yeah. So right now I have some physical artworks from I have some physical artworks from some digital artists that I much uh, that I like and that I'm starting to frame and and, and get into the household. And uh, you know, in the origin stories, you know, YouTube and, and, and Twitter stream backdrop, I will be hanging and and arranging these artworks um, progressively over the next month or so. But I am waiting for the right frame and it's just, it just hasn't arrived yet. But when, when the time comes, I will be getting, I don't know, some sort of a, a massive frame or a massive collage of, of digital frames to be putting, you know, some of these really, really meaningful artworks to me up. Me too. That's exactly my position as well. I am. I can't wait to put up dead ramen. I'm. Uh, but I just. I don't think it should That's be. A good one. I don't think it should be printed. Um, and and uh, I think it will look great from a emissive display. And and I'm just like people ask me. You know how do you even show the stuff? I said digital displays are coming. I don't know when or what. Like but six months, nine months down the track, it's going to be like a flood of them on Amazon. That's like what I promised people. Mm-hmm. And, and I think. And I know some people scoff at this and say it's not necessary. I do think that's another wave of market adoption. Mm. When you when, when you can have that level frame. Listen, we're two people, right, who believe in this industry, who invest uh, invest and collect in artwork, yeah. right? And we're both holding. We're both holding on frames. Yeah. Well, well, when something causes each of us to flip and purchase a frame and display our artwork actively in home in front of family and friends, that, that's a game changer. It just is. I, I view that as, as a clear line to a next wave of collectors. That's that's very interesting. I didn't think that far. Um, I am toying with the personal idea of opening a cafe. Uh, just I, I've always been very interested in the hospitality industry and 
um, I feel like there's there's an idea there. But I was thinking like I'll hang some NFTs in the cafe. Um, and then that got me thinking, which is a kind of an ethical, maybe just a or a social norm question, because with these NFTs, the um, I wrote a piece that that kind of uh, to, to answer all those questions about can I you know what why can't I just save it as JPEG? What does your token have any value? Uh, and and the key distinction is to say the you know the token has the value and the artwork is is it it gives a pointer to the artwork which is in the public cloud. Um, but that address is is completely not obfuscated. You know, people found the the Beeple um, full resolution artwork address, and uh, it's if if it's not broken, you can find pretty much the the source file for all these artworks. What do you think of the I guess possibility and social norms or 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 not against just people? Uh, accessing the original source files and enjoying it on their own of course they don't have resale value but like conceivably any piece you and I own uh, could can trivially be accessible and and accessible on these digital frames that anyone can buy I mean good for them right if they want to do that they're do it you know mm-hmm. do it if you want to right click save as and that and that's your mindset do it it's not ownership ownership I feel like ownership is just part of human DNA. It collection does. collection is part of human DNA. Yeah. You know, you just know. Yeah. You know whether you own one of the limited editions or you right click save as that limited edition. And if you're right click save asing and and enjoying that, you, you know, you, that's fine, but you're not um we've got to how to phrase this. I agree that they, they, that, that you know that the you know is is so real. Um, yeah. it, it's almost like it's it's. I mean, there are a couple of way, lenses to do this. I definitely don't want to paint a lens where somehow um, it's it's. I, I don't want to view, cast a negative light on people who would do such a thing because they didn't they didn't do anything illegal or even no, immoral, right? N- not at all. It's exactly. like you care or you don't. Right? Exactly. You care or you don't. And if you don't care, okay, like you can enjoy the art visual, right? But if you do care, and a lot of people care, again, I, I do feel like it's a, it's part of human DNA. Yeah. If you do care, um, then you value those sorts of things. Uh, I certainly do. I value ownership and collection. You know, I'm not that much of a materialist, but I guess I do have um, <laughs> a huge soft spot for art. Yeah. If you have, okay, let's say you have 20 digital frames, you've hung on your walls, and you've put up all your stuff. Um, would you ever display something that you don't own? No. Hmm. That's interesting. I have a bit of a follow-up question, actually. Okay. When it comes to actually combining with physical representation, so for example, if you buy that Louis Vuitton bag, I mean, you get the physical token as well, too, right? It's just potentially more valuable than the actual NFT, but the the ability to quantify that, you actually know it's a real bag, right? (laughs) Or whatever it may be. How do you think about merging the authenticity with physical realms, physical items as well. Now that you have ability to to to, to prove it actually is uh, uh, what we say it is. It's a massive industry. It'll be multi. Uh, I mean, it'll be a, a massive macro industry and a lot of micro companies that win. Um, one of the first clear clear things to me in in researching NFTs, having been someone who you know traded cards and collectibles as a kid, it's you know these grading companies, right? Sports cards are huge now. Sports cards popped. You know, they, they went parabolic too. It's a no-brainer for a grading company to come in and have an NFT that's paired with every single card that's been graded and to add some value add, to bring some sort of an artist in, to have some sort of a souped-up version of that graded NFT that adds even more value. Maybe some that, that artistic component, maybe some game of chance surrounding that. Someone's going to win there, and someone's going to win huge. And then you go on down the line. Every every bit of material possession with value, bags and um, physical art, and on down the line, everything will have an NFT at some point. Do you have any concerns of how you actually can better represent that? Like, it's cool to know that I have a real Rolex watch, but how do you easily like? There's no QR code you can easily put on a, you know, a Rolex watch. Maybe you can do it on a handbag or something that's a larger physical size. But do you have any idea as far as how someone can actually ingest that? I mean, if it's taking a screenshot of a QR code or something. I mean, wallets are going to be universal at some point, right? Wallets are just going to be easy. They're not now. They will be, and maybe they'll be. You know, 
more easily incorporated in a phone to the point that it's an app. Maybe phones won't even be a thing. Maybe we'll be moving on to the next whatever. Um, at some point, your wallet, it'll be your identity and it'll just be dropped in there. And there'll be some very, very easy way to immediately display that you're the true owner. Oh, God, thanks, thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, I think it's, I, I feel like with the Louis Vuitton example is interesting. In that case, it's almost, I think, more clearly, I don't know, unethical in the sense that there was actually a counterfeit operation and you were complicit in supporting that. Um, and also, if you do get, and, and you know, I don't know, women are pretty sensitive about these things. Like, they will call each other out. Like, they, they know what's <laughs> real and they will call each other out. So when you carry a fake LV bag, you're actually a person with a target on your back and you ca- you have the risk of being, like, called out, which is, you know, the, the opposite experience you want of, of owning something like that. So with NFTs is a little bit more innocent because the file is in the open. There's no there's no factory. There's no, you know, like, huge, uh, like, apparatus to, to make a make a, a fraudulent copy so it's i do think it's it's an emerging set of social norms i'm curious how it will e- how it will evolve but even to that example right if you have a sharp friend you know, hey let me see your let me see your nifty let me see your key <laughs> right? let me see your collection let me yeah. see it hey where, where's that piece right <laughs> yeah i like at dinner it's just like if you hang i mean let's say you hang the beeple on your giant tv mm-hmm. i mean everyone would just know haha it's like I see. Obviously, you don't own the people because it's just, you know, it's common knowledge. So it's uh, like it, it, it's a very interesting kind of a set of social norms and, and conventions, I think, that will evolve in the next couple of years. Here's a fun one that I haven't wrapped my head fully around. Let's say, are you familiar with Infinite Objects? I'm not. So Infinite Objects is, uh, I think Beeple white labeled them for his... Um, you know, his, his first set of open editions that was bull run into the ether, uh. um, right? And uh, Infected Culture, I think that was it. Yeah. So each of them came with an infinite object. It's like a little desktop stand. Look, actually looks pretty slick. USB charged, carries the charge for a few hours outside. Um, but here's what I've been thinking. You can order an infinite object for your artwork, yep. right? So let's say you have uh, the Beeble Raw. Yep. And you order the infinite objects, you proudly display it on your desk. And you asked me the question, would I ever display an artwork on a digital frame that I don't own? And I immediately answered no. And yeah. I stand by that. Yeah. But the thing I've been working over in my mind is if I buy an infinite object of an artwork that I own, and then I sell that artwork, <laughs> I feel some sort of way, James. I do. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That's a conundrum right there. It is. It's it it really it, splitting apart the token and the substrate really messes with our heads. Mm-hmm. So now you are owning a relic of something that you used to own, but now you have no former ownership of. Can you do you still feel good about yourself looking at that relic? Right. Yeah. And what's the story tell there? Exactly. Your friend comes over, sees it on your desk. Oh, it's a cool artwork. Yeah, I don't own it. <laughs> <laughs> I sold it. <laughs> Not a good story. Uh, it's it's almost like you have to, by obligation, uh, FedEx the uh, the object to the new owner. Yeah, it's interesting. That's a value add to the new owner. Yeah. Now and, if it, and if it's and if it's an artwork, so in some cases, to me, like if it's a people or if it's uh, somebody else, and the artist has sent you an infinite object, that to me, you 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 send along. Right, you send, a, or you, or you at least have a discussion as to whether the purchaser wants it or not. Right, um, you're not obligated to do that. I just think it might be an interesting thing to consider doing. But if you purchase an infinite object separately, so you've now opened up your wallet a second time, right? It's not technically linked mm-hmm. to the original purchase. That's where my conundrum is. I, I still haven't worked that out in my mind. And the artist doesn't get a cut of this secondary, right? So, yeah. Dude, the infinite objects is completely separate. So the artist has no tie to it in any way, shape, or form. It's mm-hmm. just you saying, you could technically, I think, buy an open, uh, an infinite object of a right click save as file. Sure, why not? Right? So, again, where's the story? Yeah. Roger, um, uh, how are you doing on time? Do you, when, do you want to wrap up by a certain time? Yeah, um, like 10 minutes, okay. something like that. Sounds good. All right, Zach, we're on the line. 10 more minutes. Yeah, hey, actually, I was just going to continue uh, along that same line. Um, um, I'm, I'm a, uh, 
a uh, digital artist and uh, multimedia, so I, I've been making my uh, digital art and digital frames um, prior to this, and um, has always been that's always been such a, a, f- a fun topic of trying to see how this is going to play out in terms of um, creating the digital work um, and then tying it together with these physical pieces and kind of how these these worlds are kind of spiraling around each other, um, but. Yeah, with the example of having the infinite objects one, I think there's there's such a it it, it kind of ties back into kind of the baseball cards, let's say, where you're you're bringing people in or or, um, or even toys like toy collections of having like an open box item versus like you know what's the condition of the box, what's the condition of the toy, and the relationship of those and how those um, you know affect price, etc. On these and the value of them. Um, and I, and I, I kind of feel that it's going to be, we're going to start seeing something very similar in that regard where you're going to have NFT split up with, you know, a physical item that the artist maybe originally paired with or um, having a digital work created uh, and then having a physical work released later or having a physical work, a physical, you know, frame released first, but then a digital work released later that ties back and you kind of have, you can initially separate them um, in the ecosystem and then see what the, you know, there's such a, a fascinating um, situation that will start occurring where if you're releasing them at different times, like how how does that affect um, the collection of it, say, and the, the collector's mindset. Hmm. And with the physical version, is it how, I guess, how fraud proof is it? Like the, the, the digital version, at least the token can't be replicated, but if um, is there anything protecting the authenticity of the physical versions? Well, in that case, I I'd say we just we have we have tons of experience of looking at the physical you know physical artwork being authenticated mm. um, in that regard. So I mean we've we've now opened the uh, yeah opened ourselves up to the the beauty of the NFT and something that is digitally um, you know identifiable in a in a very accurate way, but. Um, I, I see it no different than how we've looked at the past as far as uh, physical items being authenticated. Interesting. Yeah, you know, there'll be there'll be businesses coming that are going to be responsible that'll that will step into the NFT space specifically to custody. Um, you know, the, the higher end physical pieces of these puzzles. Omid, you're on as well. Hi guys, uh, great discussion. Uh, so, I have a question actually. I'm very new to this space. So, do you see, from investment point of view, do you see value in holding a portfolio of NFT arts uh, besides uh, value appreciation, like maybe driving traffic to your showroom or a portfolio, or maybe even renting out a piece for display or for other purposes? Is it is this uh, have you thought about this or is it anything been done in this space or do you see value in that? I mean, I think that there, there can be tremendous value in that, right? You can tie that back, you know, in some ways, in some ways it's just a different layer of investment, right? Um, developing your thesis for an artist, right? That could be one aspect of it. Does this show well, right? As the frames improve in, in spaces, whether, whether you want to put this art in your own space, but think of it more macro, right? Is this a piece of art that cafes would, would look to put up on their wall? Is this a piece of art that, that galleries would love to put up on their wall? I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting thing to consider. Um, and you know, some of it is guesswork, some of it's projection, but there's value there for sure. And I think that goes hand in hand, right, with the with the artist thesis. Mm-hmm. Who do you believe in and why? That could be an aspect of it, right? And and from a supply point of view, uh, what timeline do you look at this as a? So we look at the physical art, right? The historically, they are rare. That's the, the the valuable pieces, mm-hmm. but with the rate that NFT arts are being generated. <laughs> What what there must be an equilibrium point where some pieces are rare and valuable, and some other ones are very typical. And you know, how 
how, how do you value that and where, how do you look at it from valuing a piece uh, for owning it uh, you know making a thesis to own this piece and holding it as a valuable or, or as it like an item that has potential to grow in value yeah i mean there there, there are always going to be those couple handfuls of select artists who basically anything they touch turns to gold um it's just the way it works right and so in those cases a lot of pieces a lot of one of ones and, and limited editions will will continue to hold value and appreciate and then in the next category and, and again i'm speaking in categories is the market defines these artists right not i'm not saying what they're worth right what this is just how the market's going to define it then there's the next category where the artworks that will retain and appreciate maybe have to be more selective right so they're the artworks that are the the genesis pieces or the pieces that were attached to a renowned collection right a collection that was just unbelievable that this artist created so it's just being a little bit more selective it's what does this particular artwork mean is it attached to a, a deep moment either on behalf of that artist representing something in the industry right so you starting to think through those things, be a little bit more discerning. I, I would also say that the, the key word in NFTs is non-fungible. So um, if you think of, if you imagine that the only uh, buyers are um, pure, um, call it non, I don't know, I was going to say atheistic, but people who don't care about the underlying medium are only looking at a pure financial equation. They will view the art, um, every artist as kind of roughly just equally applicable places to allocate their dollars. They will take they will view it as a fungible way of investing because it's like, do I want to buy Beeple? Do I want to buy MDJ? It's like to them it's all the same. They don't care what the pixels look like. In that sense, it's fungible um, from a capital perspective. But if you um, some subset of buyers are call it fans or collectors. To those people, it, the NFTs are not fungible. Like for example, if you're only into, I don't know, Neo Tokyo pop art, you have only MDJ and a handful of other people you can possibly kind of allocate your dollars to. You will not ever spend a dollar on, you know, NBA Top Shots or Mad Cans, right? So um, I think this is why when Roger mentioned like whether the artist can build a community and a real genuine following, that's going to be so super key to, to kind of driving stable long-term value. Because once the hype is over, once the, you know, the, the, specul the speculative um, investing dollars are out of this, the people who st are still left are the, the real fans of the artists or the musicians. Like there are musicians that, that I will listen to every, every track they drop and I'm waiting to throw money at them. I, I'm literally DMing them saying, please release NFTs. And they're like, what are NFTs? And I send them a bunch of articles. Um, to those people, let's say you're a musician or an artist with 100 true fans, um, they will be setting the price basically in the future because they're the non-fungible sticky money. Everyone else is, is, like, is like just a train passing by. And I guess by that same logic, would you actually say that any of the social uh, uh, coins that are coming out, whether it be the hash masks and whatnot, too, are probably not going to be able to take off and, and, and have staying power just because, I mean, I'm, I'm a nobody and I'm not planning to be anybody in the NFT space, right? So uh, that probably wouldn't, we wouldn't want to buy anything from Josh Danielson, right? But what do you think about some of these social uh, 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 NFTs? Roger? Um depends on what the project's vision is. It, it just really comes down to the project's vision. What, how will they stay relevant, right? I think a lot of projects right now are picking up traction right away and selling out and, and there's a lot of hype surrounding them. What's the differentiating, differentiating factor three months from now, six months from now, a year from now? And I think that's where you start to see projects fall off and fall apart. Um, and, and so, you know, when we go into a, a project like Hashmask, I don't know it, is the real answer. Um, I have not done, I'm aware of it. Um, I've looked at them a bit, but I haven't done, I haven't done that thesis development, right? But that's what I look at. I look at any hints of the plan. What's the plan? Will, will it stay relevant? How? Uh, that, that's where I'd start. God, much appreciated. All righty. Roger, it is getting late our time. Um, thank you for doing this. It's been such a lovely conversation. Do you have any parting words, anything you want to say, any channels you want to promote? Um, go for it. You know, I want to go back to something I said earlier. Um, 
di- digital art is, is is just a spot to be. So we could talk about it from the the collecting the collecting angle. We could talk about it from the investing angle. I just think there's a lot here, and I think there's a lot here for a lot of different types of people. Um, I would encourage you know get involved, um, get out there on Twitter. That that seems to be the agreed upon home of the community at least at this stage. I'm sure that'll take different shapes and evolve, but get go into the rich history of digital art. You know, go, uh, I talked earlier. You know, if you are someone who's looking at those in- investment angles, there are probably a few cupboards left to pry open on, on places like Known Origin that possess a lot of history, like true history. Uh, you know, back, way way back, right in 2018, um, when this NFT space was really getting off the ground. Um, there, there are still NFTs kicking around, and, and there are still artists who probably, from that era, will go parabolic soon. We've seen it uh, recently. Shout out to X Copy. We've seen it there. I just sold an NFT, I believe, this morning for one point seven million dollars. Um, it's incredible. He's an OG, and um, all the respect. And I think you're going to see. So, you know, take that. That's a little bit out before you. You take that where you want to go with it. There are other names that date back some of which have wonderful NFTs that are buried in different places. You just have to pick up the rocks and, and turn them over and find them. Um, it's, it, it, it'll be an adventure. The, the, this whole space is, and uh, again, there's something for everyone. Pick up the rocks, turn them over and find them. Just like good old traditional value investing. NFTs is value investing. You heard it here first, folks. Nice. Thank you, James. Thanks for being such a great host. Roger, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for everyone. And uh, if this recording works, I will upload it to YouTube. Have a great evening, everyone.